I've always had a project going on where I was writing and I just keep wanting to get better at it for myself. And so, you know, I would take online courses and things like that because I was never educated in writing. I went to the military. I didn't go to college, but I've been told by several people that I just, I have a natural gift for it and I'm very thankful for that. Am I a fantastic writer? I don't think so. I just try and be a little bit better than I was yesterday. That transitioned over the years, a couple, well, two years ago, you know, when the whole world changed and the pandemic hit and everybody was fearful and afraid to leave their house. They're afraid to breathe, you know, everything. And you couldn't find toilet paper anywhere. It was crazy, you know? So in the midst of all of that, I lost my job, but my job was to be on the road. So everything shut down. And so I gave myself one day to be angry. And then the next day I woke up and said, I've been hearing a lot about this podcasting stuff. Maybe I'll look into it. So I literally Google podcasting and started one that day, not having any clue what I was doing. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 242 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This episode features an interview with Kim Langling. Now, Kim accidentally began writing in 2004, where the writing she shares her faith, nature, love of rescue animals, and living with PTSD. She's been featured as a co-author in seven anthologies, as the lead author and coordinator of a collaborative three-book faith-based series titled When Grace Found Me. The host of the podcast, Let Fear Bounce, and host of The Right Stuff, the author's voice TV show. Well, Kim and I have a fascinating conversation, and that's coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a company that is owned by Findaway. Now, Findaway is a major distributor for audiobooks for tons of major publishers around the world. And Findaway distributes to 43-plus retail and library channels. Now, Findaway Voices, as I said, is an arm or a section of the company that's dedicated to authors and working with authors and helping authors get their audiobooks out into the market. You can use Findaway Voices to find a professional narrator, or you can use Findaway Voices to get your audiobooks distributed. And you have choices. You can go all in, or you can select uh, which specific platforms you want to use Findaway Voices for. So, for example, you can go direct to some platforms, other platforms you can't go direct to, so you can use Findaway Voices for those, but you have the choice, you have the control. And that's what I love about Findaway Voices is you always have the control, you're in charge, you're in charge of setting your own price. Uh, the majority of the platforms out there, you can control when books are published, you can control how those audiobooks get out into the market. They have access to narrators that you can work with who are in their professional pool of narrators uh, that they can help project manage uh, audiobook project for you, or you can use the new Findaway Voices marketplace to self-serve and find your own narrator. And there's different royalty splits you can do with narrators as well. You can pay them all up front, or you can do a payment share option where you can pay them just a little bit 50%, I should say, and then split some of the royalties with the narrator so that the risk is not always on the narrator in that case, which is the case with ACX. So I love that Findaway Voices is thinking about the narrator, is thinking about the author, and is providing tools and resources to help you make informed decisions and choices about your audiobook destiny. And if you want to see how you can leverage Findaway Voices for your audiobook business, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And now on to comments from recent episodes. So 
Uh, several comments. I'm just going to read some of the ones from Twitter. I have a comment uh, from H. Claire Taylor <laughs> on Twitter, uh, which is at Claire or whatevs. And uh, Claire was a guest, of course, on episodes 240. And she was also the featured voice and guest for 241. And she shared episode 240, which was a, combina- a conversation that we had about character and story alignment and uh, industry alignment. And, and she said big thanks to Mark uh, for having me as a guest. It was lovely to cover some goofy topics along with a serious. And of course, oh, I love this. Of course, she, she did a little, uh, the little emoji of the clinking beer glasses. Oh, Claire, you know the way to my heart, or at least to my, at least to my liver. <laughs> and, uh, but oh, seriously, Claire, thanks for, thanks for coming on uh, and being on the last two episodes of the podcast. It was, really, uh, it was really great to chat with you. And of course, to, to share uh, advice for authors as well as advice for the industry. And uh, also on Twitter, Paulette Stout, at Stout Content. Now, you may remember Paulette from uh, episode 223, episode titled Love Only Better, which was the name of, of her novel, um, first novel. And she says, I can die happy. I've been retweeted by at Kevin Tumlinson, at the Creative Pen, and at Mark Leslie in the same day. Hashtag indie royalty. Hashtag swoon. <laughs> oh, uh, thanks, Paulette. That was, that was awesome. But uh, we all retweeted an awesome thing that Paulette had shared uh, about an article about the industry and and about the reality of it. And I'll share a link to that in the show notes. So thank you so much, Paulette. Hey, you shared something truly awesome and we had to do our part in helping to re-share that. <laughs> also, on, uh, also on the Twitter sphere, Maddie Dalrymple at The Indie Author, who you may recognize from numerous episodes <laughs> of this podcast, is uh, she, and she's also a co-author of mine on, uh, on a book on short stories called Taking the Short Tack. Uh, Maddie says, Who do I support on Patreon? The ever generous at Mark Leslie Lefebvre, frequent visitor to at the Indie Author Podcast, whose stark reflections on writing and publishing podcast is always an inspiration. Thank you so much, Maddie, uh, not just for that just uh, tweet, but also for being a patron of the show. And uh, I'm just going to pause here to thank all the patrons of the show, including Maddie, who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections. But I appreciate that. That was that was lovely of you to share, Maddie. And the last uh, comment I'm going to share from Twitter is from Edwin Downward, uh, at Edwin Downward on Twitter. And, and he tweeted, had a chance to listen in, and I'm inserting this, uh, to episode 241, Indie Publishing Has a Creep Problem on my commute this morning, and now think everyone who follows me should do the same. We all need to step up and do our part. So when I retweeted this, and then I thanked Edwin for sharing that episode and for stepping up, he responded with this. He said, I've been on both sides of that fence, only I was mature enough to listen when called out and couldn't not boost your signal. Thank you, Edwin. It takes a really strong person to admit when they're called out on something that they were wrong and to change. So thank you, Edwin, for doing that. I'm, I'm sure we've all made errors along the way. I know I have. We're all human after all. But to actually admit to being on the other side of that fence, the, to admit that, that you had done something uh, in error and wrong in such a difficult-to-face issue that people don't want to talk about, that, that's, a, that's a big thing, and it's so needed. So, Edwin, thank you for being open for being open to listening when called out and not just getting defensive and then for turning around and boosting that signal so that we can all continue to have these discussions we can all continue to learn and we can all continue to grow so thank you guys so much for your comments uh those are comments all from twitter you can uh, hit me on twitter i'm at, at mark leslie you can also leave comments on any episode of the show over at starkreflections.ca i did have a comment uh, sent to me via one of my awesome patrons, and it's sort of a follow-up to something we talked about in a few episodes back, but I'll share that in the next episode, so you can also leave comments over there. So again, thanks so much for all your comments, and now, a brief personal update. You guys are probably getting sick of me talking about just how much I'm loving um, working with Julie Strauss on Lover's Moon on the uh, novel and, and, and I do have to I do have to share uh, something that was kind of funny is uh, so Julie and I are, are round robining 
this novel. We've we've kind of beat out all the stories following uh, Gwen Hades, Hades uh, romancing the beat. And we're just kicking the manuscript back and forth. Uh, over the course of this entire month, uh, we've been writing it taking a few days off uh on like sundays off for example and i just finished i just turned in chapter 17 and so she's going to write chapter 18 tomorrow which would be friday and on saturday i'm going to write chapter 19 and then we're almost done it's kind of like i think there's uh, 20 chapters and then and then the epilogue and then then the first draft is done and then we get that over to julia uh our uh, editor that we've hired for this project uh, and julie's worked with her before and the funny thing was, uh, we're leaving comments in the manuscript that we're kicking back and forth. And I had Lover's Moon, a Canadian werewolf novella, because I was thinking it might be twenty or 30,000 words. Well, we're at over 50,000 words as of me turning in chapter 17. And, and I suspect it's going to be closer to 65, maybe even 70,000 words by the time we are done with this. And so she crossed out uh, novella and wrote in uh, novel. And in the comment that she left in the Word document, which was quite quite hilarious, was, It feels like time to admit the truth, Mark. <laughs> yes, Lover's Moon is going to be a novel. And, and the, the reason I'm talking about this experience is because I'm, I'm working on this project. I'm also collaborating on a nonfiction book for authors right now. And I'm collaborating on a French translation of uh, one of my short story collections. And... Honestly, these collaborations are so fulfilling. They're so rewarding. I think one of the challenges, and I have to remind myself, is Julie is an amazing writer. I really, I love everything she's written. Um, I even love her newsletter. I just love her style so much. And when I'm reading one of the chapters she sends to me, she always sends it and is like, oh, I think it's horrible and, and, and it's not ready yet and I think I need to tweak it and I hope it's okay. Let me know if you want me to rewrite it. And I read it and I'm laughing out loud and I'm cheering and I'm, I'm, I'm just like as excited as, as my son Alexander and I, and I were at when we were at Spider-Man No Way Home. And there's certain moments where we just all yelled out, yeah! And, and I'm doing that as I'm reading this and I'm thinking about just how much better a writer I am becoming from working closely with Julie on this project. And I can't emphasize enough what it feels like when you connect with the right co-author on, on a project that you both, uh, it's, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, seriously, this has just such been a rewarding experience. And I was, as I, as I finished the, the last book in the Canadian Werewolf series, and I had some ideas on where I wanted to go with it. It's going back and digging into the backstory of Michael and Gail that has just been an amazing experience because Julie has helped me pull so many things out of both the characters, not just Gail, but out of Michael as well, that uh, have just been absolutely amazing. And so, again, it's just that, that collaborative experience. I can't express enough how rewarding that is. And so that's uh, that's been a lot of the focus um, as well as going back and editing, counting for authors and doing the tweaking there. Um, Deanna, uh, Deanna and I have given that over to a handful of early beta readers because we have to get that wrapped up and tweak uh, and a little bit more uh, edits to do before that thing comes out in uh, April. And then, of course, Lover's Moon comes out in May. So that's it for the personal update as well as the comments and the introductory matter and the ad read. Why don't we get to this fascinating conversation with Kim Langling. Hey, Kim, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Hey, Mark, thanks for having me today. Now, wonderful to get an opportunity to chat with you again. And I say again, because I've chatted with you, but my listeners have not yet heard you. So I'm so thrilled to bring you onto my show and give them a taste of, of the awesomeness that you are. The awesomeness. And you are absolutely correct, Mark. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> I just exude awesomeness, don't you I? Do. <laughs> so one of the things is in your biography, that just to try to introduce uh, my listeners to you, is you talk about the fact that you accidentally fell into writing or started writing back in 2004. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, I never considered myself a writer. Um, I would always jot down things and always had little stories running through my head. Right. But back in 2004, I'm a veteran, and I was asked to give a speech in front of a very large group of veterans um, for in my area. So it was a little over 800 people. Okay. I had never spoken in public before. I had never written a speech before. So for weeks prior, 
it was a very personal story about my grandfather because he was the last surviving World War I veteran in right. this area. So I was sharing his story. And it was so personal and, and a lot of heaviness in it. And I wanted to get it just right. So I spent weeks and practicing in front of my coworkers over, you know, lunchtime and stuff like that. And then when the day came, it, there was well over 800 people, which I wasn't anticipating. Right. Um, t uh, television cameras in my face, newspaper reporters there. I wasn't made aware of that they would be present. <laughs> so all of a sudden, boom, there I am. And I, I gave, you know, it was, and it was 25 minutes. That's a long time to talk. Oh my God. And that was your first time doing any sort of public. First time ever public speaking. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it was quite the initiation. But I, you know, I, I gave my story. It was very emotional. And when I was done, it was so silent. And my immediate thought was, oh my gosh, I sucked. Oh no. It was absolutely awful. And I just stood there. And then I heard sniffling and realized. They were, people were crying. Hundreds of people were crying. And then one clap and then two claps. And then the, they just went crazy. And then I was like, oh, okay, okay. I think they liked it. And I was just, you know, a nervous wreck as soon as I was done. During it, I was okay. But as soon as I was done, that back, you know, that uh, reaction of, okay, you're done. And then, and then you start shaking. And my voice was like, oh, thank you so much. You know? <laughs> And then the local editor, the editor from the local newspaper approached me a few minutes afterwards and uh, said, would you consider or have you ever thought of doing a newspaper article or an opinion column or anything? And I said, oh, no, I'm not a writer. I am not a writer. <laughs> right. And he said, well, who wrote the speech? And I said, well, I wrote it. And he goes, you are a writer. Would you like to do a monthly column regarding veterans issues? And me being me. I just said, okay, <laughs> you know, I had, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but, uh, so I started doing that and it was, you know, sharing veteran issues and different things that veterans deal with and what they struggle with. And then it turned into personal stories of combat veterans from all eras and all wars. And that turned into something that I actually, you know, I got a following and I would get emails and phone calls from people saying, wow, you know, you just made my grandpa just shine, you know, and right. it, it was an amazing, amazing journey. I did that for a long, I still, I still provide the monthly articles every once in a while, all these years later, but so many of the people that I interviewed have since passed. Uh -huh. There are Korean World War, or Korean veterans and World War II veterans and uh, several former prisoners of war. So it was an incredible incredible journey to be able to share their pieces of history and that just inspired me to keep on writing and then I just had this bug it was like everybody has a story including myself I had not ever thought of sharing my own and I thought you know I want to be that person that can share other stories so that's that's how it all began. <laughs> wow. And so you had uh, started off by mentioning you were a veteran in the story about your grandfather who was a vet. Um, what what were you doing uh, in that in that life? Like, what was your role? Uh, I was in the I was in the Air Force. Okay. And I did Morse code. I was in military intelligence. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. And then are you, is it okay to ask about uh, a little bit about the story from your grandfather or that pivotal moment where you were in front of the 800 people? Sure. And terrified? Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a beautiful story, actually. Yeah. Um, at the time I shared it, he had passed away three or four years before then, right. um, four days before his 104th birthday. Oh. And during World War One, he was a part of the boys of company B literally it was the boys yeah. of company B from our area and um, they were you know shipped off overseas and he ended up in France in a small village called uh, called Fimes right what is now a sister city of the city I live in um, huh. but it was called Fimes France and there's this small bridge there that the Germans and the Allies were continually blowing up, rebuilding, blowing up, rebuilding. And my grandfather was part of the allies and the American forces protecting that bridge in this small town in France. And 
um, on the 11th day of the 11th month, uh, when the armistice was signed and fighting didn't technically cease until, you know, a while later, but that day the armistice was signed. The mayor at that time of Fiemes presented those boys that had survived to that day, presented them with a bottle of wine from the village. And the boys, the comrades, uh, they said, you know, they're not going to drink it and they're going to keep it and it's going to pass from comrade to comrade. And they formed the last man's club and that bottle of wine would pass from comrade to comrade. So when one passed away, it would go to the next and to the next. And my grandfather was the last man of the last man's club. Oh, wow. and so that's, that's the story. And there's more to the story, but that's the story right. I wanted to share because it's a hometown story. You know, he's a hometown hero, you know, the last surviving world war one veteran. And, um, it was just an amazing, I get kind of worked up even talking about it now, yeah. but uh, it was just, it's just an amazing story. And I felt so strongly that it needed to be told. Right. And people need to remember. Right. And uh, yeah, that's, that's his story. So that's beautiful. Just kinda um, went and, from and, there. and what it was is you were, you were bringing life into your grandfather's story, but also all of his his comrades, all of these people, and what? How many were, were left? At, I mean, on the bridge that day. I think that there were maybe eighty-two that were, because I tried to find family members of other ones, but they had all passed on. long since passed. They had passed right. maybe in their eighties. He he outlasted, I think, all of them by at least twenty Ooh. years. Wow. Um, yeah, it was it was uh, it's, it's it's amazing story. It truly is, and there's you know there's a lot more to it, but that's the the summary of it and right. I felt that it needed to be shared but to also give honor to him and those and those those men right. because they blazed the trail for so much that we have today right. and I think too often people forget yeah and so you did this project for the column where you got an opportunity to, to reach out and connect with people. Was it, was it mostly local veterans or families, or was it from anywhere across the U S like, it was so typically local, yeah. how it began, because I'm, I'm, I'm involved in a veteran organization myself. I'm a life member. And okay. so I started with a couple of those guys, they were Vietnam vets and those, those guys don't share their stories. Right. They, they just don't. And I wasn't sure how well it would go because here I am, Compared to them, I was 20, 30, 40, 50 years younger and a female. Right. And I'm thinking, why are these guys going to want to share their stories with me? And I thought, well, I will never know unless I try. So one would introduce me to another or one would say, hey, you need to talk to this guy or hey, you need to talk to this guy or colleagues that I worked with. They'd say, well, my grandpa's a World War II veteran. He was in the Navy He's never, ever spoken about anything or my uncle was a prisoner of war and he never talks. But the amazing thing is when I spoke with these men and some didn't want to see me in person, okay. they only would do it over the telephone. Right. And one was very, very direct about it. And he said, I don't want to look in your face and I don't want to see your eyes when I share this story. I'm doing it once and that's it. And then I'm going to die. Wow. I went, OK, I respect that. And I was on the phone with him for three hours. Oh, my God. Frantically taking notes and holding the phone oh. on my shoulder, you know, between oh. my ear and my shoulder. And I got off the phone with that conversation. He was a former prisoner of war. And he was very graphic and gave, went into great detail. And I had to hold a pillow up to my face so he couldn't hear me crying. Oh, my God. Because it was so oh, powerful. And... uh scary and sickening and all kinds of other words, you know, and I, but I didn't want him to hear because I knew he'd stop talking and I didn't interrupt him. Right. I just let him go. And he went for three hours and he had literally never shared his story, even with his wife. And they'd been married for over 60 years. Oh my God. So yeah, I've met some amazing people with amazing stories and that's that's how it began and that's where my passion it just grew. With each story my passion grew to want to share other stories. One of these days I will share more of my own. Right. <laughs> you know, but uh it's it it just seems to keep coming to me that way. People are 
I, I'm a Christian. I have a pretty strong faith. And I feel that God keeps putting the right people in front of me at just the right time when they need to share their story. Wow. You know, and thankfully, I am open enough to realize, oh, okay, yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to help this. I'm going to help them get their story out there because when they go, the story goes. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But yeah, but you you keep them. Uh, you keep their story. You keep them preserved. So, so yeah, it's an it, honor. Actually, it's a it's a true honor. And this, so this, I mean, this, this, what you're really doing is you're connecting with another human, and you and you're helping uh, you're helping share their story in a beautiful way uh, to the family members who may never have heard it to other people to just really understand and listen to 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 what what so many people experienced but then you migrated that it seems like you've migrated that passion into the podcasts and tv shows and all the things you do like you really love talking to people you really love getting their stories how did that transition happen <laughs> yeah I, I do talk to people a lot when you put it like that <laughs> um well it transitioned from that um you know i was always working full time and I was, you know, continually, I was working on like writing projects with other people, or I was a co-author in seven different anthologies. So I've always had a project going on where I was writing and I just keep wanting to get better at it for myself. And so, you know, I would take online courses and things like that. Cause I was never educated in writing. I went to the military. I didn't go to college. Right. Um, but I've been told by several people that I just, I have a natural gift gift for it. And I'm very thankful for that. Am I a fantastic writer? I don't think so. I just try and be a little bit better than I was yesterday, you know? Um, <laughs> just try and be better every day, just a little bit. But uh, that transitioned over the years, a couple, well, two years ago, you know, when the whole world changed and the pandemic hit and everybody was fearful and afraid to leave their house, they're afraid to breathe, you know, everything. And you couldn't find toilet paper anywhere. It was crazy, you know? So. <laughs> In the midst of all of that, I lost my job. And you know, I, my, my background is all sales marketing and I did that for 24 years. So, and I, I'm, I'm good at it, I love it. Cause I get to be out there talking to people all the time. Right. But my job was to be on the road. So everything shut down and I couldn't go anywhere anymore. And they weren't set up and a lot of the customers we had were not set up for remote right. or anything similar or even close to it. So uh, I lost my job. And I gave myself one day to be angry because I'd not ever found myself in that position. Right. I'm like, what is, what is going on? And so I gave myself one day to be angry. And then the next day I woke up and said, I've been hearing a lot about this podcasting stuff. Maybe I'll look <laughs> into it. So I literally Googled podcasting and started one that day. What? Not having any clue what I was doing. Wow. Would well, you turn on a mic and said, well, let's just do this. I did. I did. I had my camera and my microphone and I just started talking <laughs> to <Wow>. myself. <laughs> which, which, which one was that? It's the very, very first one. I don't even remember what I named it because I, it's only been a little over a year and I think I'm on, I have like 87 episodes. Wow. Um, but yeah, the very, there's only a couple in there where it's mostly where it's just me talking. Right. Um, I did an end of year one for, you know, 2021. And I think okay. the very first one was just me talking. And then one, I was just having a really sad day. So I got on there and, <laughs> and, wow. and shared about <laughs> losing my dog. Oh. But uh, yeah, I, it, I, it said, I have guests on. So it's an interview style, right. you know, and you've been a guest on my podcast and it's called Let Fear Bounce. And I named it because I was so tired of seeing and hearing about all this fear that everybody's carrying around. And I was constantly saying, you got to let it bounce. If you let that land on you, it's going to become so heavy. You're going to become a recluse and a hermit and your life is going to be miserable. Right. So I kept telling people, you've got to let it bounce. So I'm going, well, I'm going to start a podcast and I'm going, gosh, what am I supposed to name it? I don't have a logo. I've never done this. And I went, well, I'm going to call it Let Fear Bounce. Because everybody has a fear. Everybody has a fear of some sort. Yeah. So I could talk to anybody. And I'm like, that's brilliant. So I went with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, it's so universal too. Because you could, you could talk to anyone from any walk of life. Right. Chances are there's going to be fear <laughs> somewhere. Right? Yeah. And I don't care if it's a fear of slugs and spiders or a fear of heights. 
you know, or fear of death, whatever. Someone right. has a fear, you know, so, yeah. and it, they're not all, I mean, the, the, you've been on the, you, as a guest, you know, we don't speak about and just, you know, go on and on about fear, but it's right. brought up and how you've overcome it, yeah. you know, and I've had a lot of people on that have went through some major, major traumatic events in their lives right. um, that could have, you know, stopped a, another person in their tracks, right. you know, or, um, they wouldn't want to go on. And so, you know, yes, I do have some very serious conversations with serious topics on there too, but it's just been, that's been an amazing journey, just wow. simply amazing with all the people I've met from all over the world. And the podcast opened the world up for me. Right. Yeah. You know, I've, I've met so many people I never would have had the opportunity to meet. Yeah. If that the is, world that, hadn't yeah. changed. Yeah, which was also very much like what the column did for you is you had this opportunity to really get to know people, share their stories. So so let's talk about um, when Grace found me. So there, there's this project that you did. Uh, again, collaboration. And uh, can you sh share a little bit? So what was that project? And, and again, how did <laughs> how did Kim find herself doing this? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what's kind of funny about that. It's a three book faith based series. It's called When Grace Found Me. And they're, they're anthologies. Okay. So there are 20 women from around the world in each volume. Okay. And the first one came about because I was a guest on a lady's podcast, podcast out of the UK. And she had just started a publishing company. And I said, you know, I have been wanting to share some of my stories and put them all together and let's chat. So we did. And, we've, and we're, we're very, very good friends now. She is still my publisher now. And um, it all started by me being a, a guest. I was on a networking group or a writer's group on Facebook. Right. And her and I connected. And then she invited me on her. Actually, it was a radio show, not a podcast. It was a radio show right. um, in England. And so her and I, and she's a Christian as well. So her and I got to chatting. And I said, well, let me, th let me toss the idea out to a few people I know here. So I did. And I had five people immediately that said yes. And then I put it on Facebook and then I had enough for one volume, but then they keep can't coming. Oh. I said, well, I guess, you know, maybe we should do two volumes. Let's do two books. So we did, but then they kept coming. I went, I, I, we're going to do, let's do three. So we literally published three books last year in 2021. Wow. Um, which is really not common, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we were, we were on a roll and the, the stories again, that's, you know, what was it? 58 women, 56 women, I think maybe total right? from all over the world, different religions, different cultures, different ethnicities, sharing something of when grace found them, you know, of, of hardships or trials and traumas that they went through. Right. Just amazing. Oh my goodness. It was amazing. I cried a lot when I read their stories as they were coming in. I cried a lot. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, and, and I mean, it's so similar to the work that you did with the veterans, right? Uh, where you, were, yes. you, you helped with their stories. So this was, they would submit the stories and then you were including them in the, in the anthologies. Yeah. And you know, along the way I learned developmental editing. Okay. I that's what I became. I didn't know what I was doing. Everything that I started, Mark, I just jumped in. I don't have any background or education on it. I just jumped in and did it. <clears throat> and um, if it feels fulfilling to me, and in right. my heart I know it's the right direction to go, yeah. and I love what I'm doing, I'm going to keep on doing it. And just that. keep on keep on learning. I'm self-taught at pretty much everything I've ever done. <laughs> so uh, I want to lean towards asking you some questions, some um, advice for a creative. So well, my listeners are writers and they're, they're interested in, in seeing different people's creative journeys and how they get there. So what's, uh, I, I suspect I'm going to, I suspect some of the advice that you're probably going to offer may involve letting fear bounce, but uh, what's some of the advice that you have for, for, you know, those listeners who is like, yeah, I've always wanted to be a writer or um, I'm trying to do this or, or they're just getting into it. What's some sort of advice based on your experience that you would say, okay, here's, here's what I would recommend, or here's something that you may want to consider. Build yourself a good tribe. Okay. Surround yourself with like-minded people. And a lot of times it's not going to be your closest friends and family. 
Okay. A lot of times it will not be. Find people that have the same mindset and the same type of heart that you do, that they have that creative thing, no matter what genre you write in. A lot of folks aren't going to get it if they don't do that themselves or they want to understand why you just spent three hours holed up in that little room or at the dining room table writing and you're ignoring everybody. They don't get it. So find people that get it and then connect with those ones that you really, you know, that you have that you get along with. Well, you know, you just have a good connection, connect with those people. Right. And don't let negative self-talk hold you back. You can't. I'm really good at negative self-talk. I'll be like, Kim, that is no good what you just wrote. No one is ever going to read that. Are you kidding me? So what I've learned, and this is a good tip. This is what I learned to do for myself. Something pops in or if I'm speaking to someone or I've interviewed them, but I want to mold the story more. I want to put, I want to be able to smell what they smelled. I want to be able to feel you know, that grit as a sandstorm's blowing through. I want to know what it felt like when it hit their cheeks. So I want to try and make sure that's all put in there. You know, what did it sound like when a mortar was, you, you, you had a mortar attack coming in and it's like a screaming whistle. I wouldn't know that. But when I'm writing that and sharing that, I want to make sure that the readers know that. So use all five senses when you're writing all five senses and don't let negative self-talk stop you. Just sit down. I call it word vomit. <laughs> <laughs> I will sit down because when it all comes to me, it's always at random times when I'm out walking my dog or it's three o'clock in the morning, I wake up and I went, oh, that's the way I'm supposed to write it. So then I, you know, I frantically will type it all out and I just, that's what I call it. I just vomit it all out, word vomit it all out. And then I walk away from it for at least a day. And I just, I always say, I'm going to let it simmer. It has to simmer on the back burner for at least a day right. and then I'll come back and read it and then I'll have such a better feeling and picture of what I'm doing and where I want to go with it. So that's my couple tips. Awesome. Thank you. Now I, I want you to offer a tip please to my dear friend Kim who's just about to get on stage and share a story about her grandfather but she had no idea there was going to be 800 people in the audience. Uh, any advice you would offer her before she's up as she's as she's facing that fear as she's about to do something she had never done before? Practice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think I became fearful until after I was done. Oh, really? So the bit, adrenaline kicked in after? Okay. Yeah, I was a bit nervous. Um, but I'm one that just jumps in. Not everybody's like that. Right. You know, and not everyone is. And so it's hard for me to put myself in someone like that shoes who doesn't jump in. So I guess what I would say is write it, write it from the heart. If you're going to be giving a speech and of course you want to write it down, write whatever you have that you're the shit, the story you're going to share, make sure it comes from the heart because people are going to they're going to catch it that way. So right from the heart, does it have to be perfect? No, because there's not a single person out there that's perfect. And there's not a single perfect speech. I don't care what anybody says. It's not a single perfect one. You might have a few extra ums and ahs in there and that's okay because you're doing it from the heart and it's real. You want to be raw and real and practice, practice with someone, maybe not close friends and family. And I've just found that that's true for me. It might not be true for everybody else, but practice with colleagues or someone from church or someone you work with or your neighbor, you know, whoever practice it. And if you're not comfortable doing that, stand in front of the mirror and practice it. Okay. Cause I did that too. Just talk to yourself in the mirror. You can have an incredible conversation with yourself if you put your mind to it. <laughs> problem is that sometimes my mirror doesn't listen to me <laughs> i know isn't that amazing how that works <laughs> it's like but you should have hair no but <laughs> so who needs hair <laughs> kim can you uh, please tell people who want to hear more uh from you <laughs> about you uh where can they find you online uh your your podcast tv show all the all the things that you do um my 
my website is my, just my name, kimlanglingauthor.com. So it's K-I-M-L-E-N-G-L-I-N-G author.com. I'm on Facebook um, under The Right Stuff, and that's the name of my television show, W-R-I-T-E, The Right Stuff, and it's the, the Right Stuff, The Author's Voice, all about authors and their writing journeys. Um, podcast is called Let Fear Bounce. That has a Facebook page as well. I'm on Twitter and Instagram, and I think it's Lingling Author for both of those. I'm on Clubhouse. I'm all over the place. Wow, cool. And I'll make sure to include uh, links to all of those places in the show notes over at Stark Reflections. Dot ca if if there is anyone listening uh, that is interested in trying to connect with you potentially because they may be an interesting guest for your show are there ways that people can reach out to you yes they can uh, email me is probably the best and my email is just langling my last name langling author at gmail.com awesome uh, and i'm so fortunate and thankful that uh, mickey uh, my publicist uh, introduce me to you because I've had the opportunity to chat with you and I was just looking forward to this excuse <laughs> to talk to you again to have you on my <laughs> show so Kim thank you so much for hanging out with me today oh I appreciate it I enjoyed it thank you such an insightful conversation with Kim now I wanted to just share a, a single reflection on uh, the interview that you just listened to and I was thinking back about when Kim was talking about, um, basically, she said, if it feels fulfilling to me, I'm going to keep on doing it. And that's my advice to you. I want to take that and I want to kind of highlight Kim's advice and kind of reinterpret it or restate it just to make sure that you picked up on it. Because I've been thinking about that a lot and I've had several conversations with authors in the last week where I reminded them of that because there are no guarantees that the things we do are going to be successful, that they're going to earn us money or any of the things. The reality, the stark reality of our book industry is that the majority of books published don't make a lot of money. Yes, the possibilities are there and I'm all about the options and the possibilities and I'm all about hope, but I'm also about the realistic factor because too many authors are beating themselves up thinking everyone else is making all the money and they are not making all the money. So even um, a couple authors I spoke to this week were a little bit frustrated that they had only had three-figure months uh, as authors, or, or, or just barely, you know, every once in a while they, they crack th three figures a month, meaning they're making $100 or less a month on their, on their books. And I had to remind them that that's actually relatively, when you look at the grand scheme of things and the hundreds of thousands of authors who are publishing, that's actually not that bad. That's actually pretty good. But all they see when they go on the online forums and they see authors talking about their stuff are the six-figure authors and the seven-figure authors talking about making $100,000 just today. Well, they're also, you know, spending 40000 or 50000 or $75,000 a day on ads to make that $100,000, meaning you have to start with a lot of money. And and even and even there are a lot of authors, a lot of authors making uh, five and six figures uh, as well. But there's many, 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 many more not. And so the reality, and I'm not saying um, don't quit your day job or any of those you know disparaging things, but the reality is, as much as we love the things that we do, there's no guarantee that the things we're going to do are going to turn into money. So for me, and this this works really, really well for me, and, and it's really helped me a lot, and it may be something that works for you, is spend the time doing the things you really enjoy, the things you are passionate about. So as a writer specifically, write the stories that you want to read. Write the stories that you need to tell. Write the stories that resonate with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, that resonate with you 365 degrees as opposed to chasing the trends and chasing the things that you think are going to make you money because just chasing those trends can be fruitless because potentially you could even be making really, really good money but not be satisfied. At the end of the day, if you focus your energy on the things you love, the things you are so, so passionate about doing, I'm not going to say follow your passion and the money will follow because that is not the truth here. The stark reality is follow your passion does not mean you're going to make money. But I can guarantee you one thing. 
if you follow your passion, you're definitely going to be satisfied intrinsically, regardless of the external outcome that happens. If you follow your passion, there's a chance that can turn into success, however you define success, whether that's getting, you know, millions of readers, millions of sales, millions of dollars, whatever that success is to you. Maybe the success is just just having one person read that story and it changing their life. But whatever that is, if you don't get that success, if that success never comes, at the very least, you spent your time, you spent your heart, your soul, your energy, your blood, your sweat, your tears doing something that you believed in that you felt passionate about, that was fulfilling, as Kim said, to you. I would argue that you should keep on doing that because that intrinsic value, that reward that you get just from doing those things that feel so good are the right thing to do. Whether or not they lead to success externally doesn't matter because they led to intrinsic and internal success. That's it for the reflection for this episode. And that is it for episode 242. Thank you so much for joining me here on the Stark Reflections podcast. If you like the podcast, you can feel free to support it over on Patreon. You can go over to patreon.com slash starkreflections. You can also leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. Of course, one of the best ways that you can support this podcast is to share it with a friend that you think may get some value, maybe even some intrinsic value from the podcast thank you again so much for listening and so until next week and next episode this is mark leslie lefebvre wishing you great writing and good stark reflections thank you for listening to the stark reflections podcast you can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.